Okay, thank you everyone to be here today. Uh, we are going to talk about retail media, which is um, a main topic of this morning. Um, I'm very happy to have fantastic guests and my panelists today. Uh, Richard, which is uh, our um, CEO, sorry, I'm going to make sure that I have that right, um, CEO for mileage, that's correct. Um, which is United Airlines, and you had some announcement uh, recently about your uh, your activity. It's going to be interesting to uh, to learn more about it. Uh, Alban, which is at Epsilon, and you are the CEO for Europe and EPAC. That's right. And uh, we have Paul Lenz, uh, which is the executive director of um, CBS Media Exchange. So, um, yeah, the overall idea of this morning is to discuss about. Uh, what is the evolution of retail media and the created retail media and what are the challenges we have in that field because it's a, it's a new topic. And so the first question will be, uh, how do we address retail media and first party data uh, in, uh, I mean, in this new activity? Because we have a lot of um, yeah, challenges, I guess. So I don't know, uh, Richard, or you want to talk about it? or? I can start. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, Richard Nunn, CEO of United Mileage Plus. You may have seen we just launched a, our own travel media network, Connected Media. Um, so I guess that's our opening salvo around first party data. Um, yeah, we flew 165 million people in 2023, the world's largest airline, and there's a lot of data that we sit on. And it's not, there's obviously clearly commercial value there. And I know we'll get on to some other questions around retail and commerce media. Um, but there's also operational benefits as well to the airline. It has to be like 100% accurate in terms of that data. So the value of first party data just to get you on the plane and off is, is critical. Um, so that's kind of the first point for the airline. The second point is for the core business that I run today, which is the mileage plus loyalty business. And again, that sort of depth and breadth of data and stickiness. Um, so it's more enhanced first party data than a non-member, but it's also verified and logged in. And then obviously this kind of emerging flywheel effect that we're creating is this new media network that we've set up, um, which is all about kind of personalization and connecting brands with our customers in a way more personalized way than it's ever been done before. I think you've, the notion that I came in, I've been there about a year. Um, it is extraordinary and I've been in the world of media for many, many years. And if you think about what we do on earth, 24 seven in front of a TV and every single screen and then you go into this metal tube in the sky at 35,000 feet It is like going back in time <laughs> to some degree um, But we're going to change all that and it that screen in the plane will be the most addressable screen out there We know who sits there um, and we can create a lot more value so that culmination in terms of operational marketing and this new media network is the value of our first party data at scale um, So that's us yeah, fascinating. So uh, at CBS, am I working here? Yeah, you hear me? Yeah. I don't know. Mic's not working too good. It helps to turn it to the green button from red. Um, so at CVS, we have similarly an incredibly long history of loyalty, one of the longest existing loyalty programs out there. We have 74 million extra care card holders. And somewhat similar to being in the tube, in the sky, we have 9,000 terrestrial stores. Um, so all of those transactions, the bulk of our transactions happen in store and not online, which is a little bit different from a lot of uh, retail media networks out there. While we do have this very old program, we are a newer, not quite as new as you, uh, retail media network. Um, but the fidelity of that data, we have almost 65% of the purchases happen in store. People are swiping their card. So we don't have to know exactly who you are to get you on and off a plane, but we do have a lot of data around prescriptions, purchases, and you know decades of this history, entire families and households. And I think we take that responsibility incredibly seriously, and we have to. Um, but I think what we're seeing is the ability to help our suppliers reach our customers with their messaging and their product information so people can make better, healthier decisions on what they're purchasing. That's really at the bottom line of what, we are, what we're doing as, as an RMN. So that, but I think everything, the success of retail media networks is really gonna be about 
the scale and fidelity of the data. Yeah, I guess that's one of the topics you have, Alban, uh, with yeah. Epsilon, no? Yes, yes. Um, and I'm going to speak relatively fast before I faint because of the heat. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, we, we, we see similar challenges. And maybe just uh, to give a little bit of context uh, in terms of Epsilon. So um, we have seen the evolution um, of retail media um, because we built a retail media network for on-site with Citrus Ad. Um, and then we evolved it into a retail media off-site uh, network. Um, the problem that we analyzed there uh, was that um, the retailers wanted to get a sense of what they could do with their first party data, that's for sure, but they also wanted to find new users and they wanted to uh, find a way to match it, match the information from on-site and off-site. Uh, so this took us quite a while, but what we did is that we started to work on an ident identifier called CoID, and the idea behind that was to make sure that we would be prepared for the cookie-less uh, environment that is going to come. Um, and we are seeing very, very similar challenges because um, if you want to do this properly, if you want to build a core ID system or an ID system, the f number one problem that you're going to experience is the scale. Uh, you are going to uh, need some time to find the correct match rates between the, uh, the users that you find on the retailer site. And then if you go to, um, well, maybe a partner or if you go to a publishers, you're going to also uh, find difficulties in making sure that you're talking to the same inv individual. Uh, so this took us a while, but I think we are getting in a good position now. So scale is a, also a big problem for us, a challenge, I would say. Um, yes, I mean, that's, that's interesting to see that retail media becomes, uh, let's say, a, brand, a branding topic than it was not before. Uh, before we were like, buying and reaching out to people through, let's say, different platforms or buying that. And now with retail media, <coughs> We, uh, the brands are more in control about the way they are going to mix their data, their first party data, and creating this loyalty program online and uh, reaching out to people offline. So um, is it something, so I'm going to go to the creation of the, of the, dis the, the discussion. So um, do you see, I mean, when, when I speak about creation, I'm talking about more on the SSP side and how you mix uh, data, first party data and media in order to push specific type of deals uh, to, uh, to the brands or um, the advertisers that want to buy specific audiences. Uh, I know it's a new concept, it's something very, uh, very new, so uh, not going too much into the detail, but do you see an evolution uh, because of the fact that you're investing a lot in first party uh, data and the cookie-less deprecation is going to, uh, to happen soon, I guess? Um, do, we, do you see more uh, an evolution in the market with more offers coming from the SSP and created deals instead of buying on the open uh, markets like we are doing, I mean, today? Um, I don't know if that's a topic that someone wants to, <laughs> to talk about. Well, that's a very difficult one, though. Um, but yes, uh, it depends who is looking at the, um, at the first party data. Uh, and what you want to do with the creation. Um, on our side, what we, what we saw is that if you just give the ID uh, or the ID graph to um, a user, let's say a retailer or a brand, um, probably 90% of the time, the brand is not going to know what to do with it. And so um, it, um, it was necessary for us to tie the, what we call the core ID, so our uh, identity, um, to an actual deal ID, um, so that we can then create some kind of curation that would make it more efficient for the brands. Um, this is also, for us, it, it's also essential because we are part of a bigger group called Publicis, right? So Publicis does have access to the brands and does have a very different way of working with the brands. So we needed to find a way to translate what we are doing uh, 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 technically um, in brand uh, language. Um, and uh, I think we are getting there. Um, but this is going to require a lot more um, uh, analysis, uh, obviously. And although we are going to do the creation ourselves for the time being, or via partners, uh, such as you, hopefully very soon, um, we think that the retailers uh, and the brands are going to uh, staff uh, in, with analysts to be able to create some creation deals themselves. So that would be the ultimate goal for us. 
So you feel like there's a there's a path where um, there'll be like self-service curation even by brands and agencies? That would be awesome, yeah. That, that would be would great. Be, yeah. They would love that. Yeah, I know. And exactly. we want to make them happy. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, in initially we didn't want that. Right. Uh, but since they all want the same thing, now we are thinking, okay, maybe there's something for us Actually, to do. Actually, that's a great idea. Yeah, right. We're let's, ready let's to build do that. something. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the other piece of that that's, that's valuable for the the brands that have the loyalty programs and that data is, um, you know, I would feel more protected. I feel like we're we're really taking care of, and that curation process for us is really a safe haven for our for our own data set, and to be able to package it just the way the buyers want. I mean, it would it's it sounds really great. Um, I think also what's interesting about it is to be able to curate not only to curate across as a retail media network, not just our owned and operated, but everything that's going on everywhere. Right, it's one package to buy, and if it's self service. And we're getting way ahead of ourselves here, but like, it looks pretty good. Like that's, I think that's the, the transaction world we'd like to be in, where that does flow much more. It's more fluid. I don't think we are so far off. I think it's uh, it's almost there. Honestly, I think I think so. Really? I know not not just our technology, but I think generally speaking, I I can see that things are accelerating to to make sure that we uh, we can have something like this for for especially for or around loyalty programs. Um, I th earlier we discussed about the DCO, the evolution of DCO and the ability for us to uh, target the users um, with, uh, with um, very highly uh, uh, customized, uh, usually gen AI based uh, uh, creatives. That's, that's the way you're going to also make sure that the missing link uh, is going to uh, be covered because uh, yes, it's great to make sure that you find the right individual. You need to make sure that you have the right loyalty information so that you don't mess up with the general branding message. And the third thing is that you need to absolutely make sure that the creative you put in front, creative or video or whatever it is, is going to actually uh, be liked by the person and not be perceived as intrusive. And Gen AI can help big time with this, I think, because we cannot do this manually at scale. So, and I, I guess that's a topic that you are working actively, no? Um, creating those capabilities into creatives as as Epsilon, but also as part of Publicis. Yeah, well, not me personally, obviously, because I'm not that creative um, and I'm not a coder. But uh, yes, Publicis has developed uh, Gen AI especially to do this. So, well, well, not only to do this, but um, to make sure that this can be used by technologies like, like, like ours. And, um, and they are uh, tying this to um, the identity that I mentioned. So the, the ultimate idea is that you have an identity, identity profile. You're then able to activate this. So it's basically the evolution of CDP. And you then can on the fly create based on prompts or based on very simple messages. You can cre create a specific message and specific image for the person, for the individual, not for the campaign. That's very important. I mean, from our perspective, we're we're leaning in, um, but carefully, I think, on this because I think back to your point, Peter. The value of anyone's first-party data is is phenomenal. We all know about data leakage, um, so I think this pendulum does swing towards any first-party data provider. And I, I think you're the same, w but we don't want to be a data provider. Um, we do want to wrap it up in media. You know, there is a little bit of opaqueness there, but it ultimately the value is that it's a verified, you know, first party logged in. So it is about the data. Um, so we definitely see value in that. I mean, do we get to, self I mean, self-serve would be awesome because if you have scale, then um, we're not there yet. And I, your point also about, you know, Gen AI automating that, I think gives the value of scale. Um, but ultimately, when push comes to so shove, it's about the, va the scale that you have, and I think you can wrap it up. But I, I do think it's a relatively nascent thing across the industry. But we, we started, was it last December, in off-platform, um, which is the easy way to go. And I, but I think it has to be managed, because you can end up, you know, you could end up with tens of thousands of segments, and ha you know, how you manage that across multiple agencies. You know, there's, there's a scale play there, for sure, but I think how you manage it becomes a challenges and is that the onus on a united or a connected media to do that or is that an agency play or is it just one partner i think that's a that's an open question are, are uh, you guys as equity are you guys building kind of ml and ai to help do the curation for us also or with us 
I mean, uh, yes, I mean, we, uh, we have data scientists and we have a lot of people working towards uh, how we can facilitate uh, not only on the data or, let's say, the creation of the data, but also um, understanding the packages that we can create. Uh, I will not say automatically because it's not going to be that easy, but um, to facilitate uh, the creation of PMPs or created deals specifically because uh, if not, it's, I mean, the number of data and touch points that we have now, it's massive. So manually, it's not going to be possible right. to do. So we need to have, of course, machine learning uh, and we need to have good algorithm to help us to understand uh, where we can maximize the value of the data, but not only, it's where the combination of data and media can really be maximized. And that's, of course, that takes time, but that's the, uh, the, the goal is to do that, of course. Yeah. Do, you, do you think that the, is curation just a, an evolution of audience creation? Or is it, is it materially different? Because I think we spend a lot of time with our audience construction based on our data set, right? Because we want our suppliers, the right suppliers, to reach the right audiences with the right message, of course. Um, so I guess that's a question. Is that, is that curation also, or is curation in your world different? Um, no, that's correct. I, mean, I will say curation is, um, is here to resolve two different things, two different questions. One is, how can we take advantage with all the data that we have now? Because before we had no data, the data was part of the, the media. Um, how can we add this layer of data and all the data sets that we want in order to comply to the KPIs that the adver advertisers are looking for? And each advertiser, each industry has different type of uh, um, KPIs. It can be a different look back windows. It can be really a different type of uh, uh, viewability on the on the campaign and so on. So so we need to comply to that and data will help us to do that, to be more accurate in the way we segment and reach out to the specific audiences. And there is also the evolution of you being more in control about your own data sets and maximizing the value of your first party data. Naturally, you need to be more in control about how you you expose those first party data to the world and still be in control. And curation is a way to approach that because then you can still do that with clean rooms and be secured in the way that you are not going to, uh, to let's say, to, to let go your, uh, your valuable first party data as well. But I've got a question, actually, you know, for, well, for both of you actually, is I talked about that pendulum swinging kind of to the retail commerce world, right, because of the underlying first party data. But when you talk about enrichment of curation, is that a third party thing that sits with the retailer or does it sit with the agency? Because agencies are sitting on a lot of data as well. So then does it swing? Do, do we create, curate first party with media and it's passed to an epsilon who then enhance that and then it's enabled by an equative? Uh, how's that, how does that process work? Because actually, it's like all three of our parties here. There could be a one plus one plus one equals five, or is it just on kind of the commerce media sector? Where, where, where do you see that swing? Um, so I don't know about the equative. I don't know enough yet. Um, but uh, between the retailer, the, so it depends. So it depends the data we have access to, obviously. Um, and it depends also the level of um, uh, granularity of data we can uh, we can have. Um, but in general, I would say it's, it would be a mix of the retailer's data and um, additional information that we have. But we typically do not mix it with um, uh, other retailer's data. The only way this could happen is if there is a network um, that is created. Uh, so, for example. Um, in the US, we have something called Grocery One, where they share data uh, in order to uh, build a stronger retail media network. In Europe, we have now a joint venture between Publicis and Carrefour called Unlimitel. And the purpose, although right now we are not doing it, the purpose at some point of time might be to have some kind of network where you can have um, data that uh, is shared. But we are talking about data that is shared 
with the intent of creating some some retail media campaigns, not not for anything else at this point of time, because that would be too. We need to make sure that uh, we respect uh, the the well, not not only the privacy but also the the actual value of the data, as you mentioned. We don't want to share, for example, careful data with anyone else. That would make no sense. Um, so just on that though, I'm yeah. just thinking of a scenario with. with Connected Media United, you could be doing a brand campaign for Dove on a plane, and then you could mix that. You wanna, with CVS. And you want to buy it from CVS? You want to all right? You want to buy it from CVS and that's get it. the attribution all the way through, right? right. So that's yep. a mix of two commerce. Yep, that's possible. Yeah, yeah, that's yep. a possible scenario, across, right? especially if you're talking about different verticals. Yeah, it's easier because there is no competition between. Technically, there is no real yeah. competition between the the, the data, uh, and you can build the bridges. This is something we can do already um, by creating a loyalty network. So we would cre create a loyalty network dedicated to a few uh, players, and we're going to make sure that we tie this around the core ID that we have. Um, yeah. And I guess the, um, the combination of the agency and your own network is that on the agency side, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, um, they are multi-screen, um, they, are, they are seeing the I mean, the overall journey of the, um, of the audiences and the people, and this is where they can also hide uh, and let's say tie the different proposals that you, we have on the market to create the full experience on the 360 degrees instead of, because I will say retail media, they have their own, let's say, econometrics. They, they want to maximize their first party data through their own channels and create an additional loyalty or let's say a more engagement with the people that are, I mean, their clients. That's, I, I would say that's the, that's the role. And also, of course, creating an additional business stream uh, into, um, into the company. But if you look, I mean, if you step back and you are at the agency, the agency will say, I mean, I see the overall picture. I see you, but I see also the brand who wants to advertise across different channels and they can synchronize and also multiply that to, uh, let's say, to expand the, um, the capacity of the, of the campaign. I think that's also the, the addition. It's not one plus one plus one, but it's more the, uh, the capability to, uh, to gather those forces together. And I don't think that um, anybody, or it's very difficult to, to scale if you do not have, I mean, if you are not a network or an agency, no? Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, but this would be the key difference between, uh, let's say, a loyalty project like we, we just discussed about um, and a pure retail media uh, play. Because um, if we are in a retail media configuration, then obviously an agency would have a lot of additional uh, value uh, because they, will, they would be able to look at the overall industry and they would look at... A, a large amount of brands ready to invest. Um, if we purely look at the loyalty, it could be something that is built without the retail media uh, in mind. You don't necessarily need to su subsidize the cost of your loyalty. You can build it for, for yourself or because you're going to boost the partnership. Um, so that, that's kind of two different approach, ap approaches. But um, if we purely talk about retail media, and I know it's the topic today, yes, uh, the agency would have a lot of added value there. A lot, in my mind. So, um, the, I mean, the question is also, what was the most challenging, let's say, part of your job uh, in creating your retail media offering? Um, I mean, and your activity today. Is it um, scaling the data, the reach? Is it unifying your data across the board? And do you have any example in mind where you, I mean, you had some challenges. I'm, I'm asking because I know that retail media or data in general is, uh, can be a challenge to unify, especially with ID graphs, especially with the change of technologies happening, I mean, all the time. So what is the most challenging piece in building your retail media business? I, I would say one of the surprisingly challenging things that still exists to me is that I've been in media a very long time, and probably 20 years ago, we're doing tons of data distribution and content distribution deals from the publisher side. Everything was FTP. Almost everything is still FTP. 
that's a problem, right? Because we have the delivery time to get 74 million records of rich data to a platform to do identity matching and matching to a different ID that can then be transacted. Each one of those steps is a big hop. And I don't, it surprises me still, but I think one of the things that is just, it's a surprising challenge that we still face is pushing files. This, we, everybody's got a cloud and everybody's in the cloud. There is no reason that these aren't just views that are instantly acted on rather than, you know, and I, I think it's just, it's just everyone's comfortable with the legacy stuff and if that's the way it's been done for 20 years, why we're not gonna change it. Like we, a lot of stuff is still done in Excel. That doesn't make sense today. So I, I think that's been a very, that continues to surprise me with our industry and with, with where data is. Hopefully people have different stories to tell about that than I do. Yeah, from, from our perspective, um, I agree with that point. Um, you know, we're, we're an airline, that's what we do, that's our core business. So we had data in different kind of silos across the business, so unifying that under a United ID. Um, it's just been an internal technical challenge, and I don't think there's, I mean, there's a lot of technology out there, everyone says they've got the same thing, there isn't actually a silver bullet. Um, but I think where you're going is right, where I see, and it's a I don't know if we'll get into this or not, but clean rooms, um, which is a different topic, but I think it's all going to end up in the cloud, right? And there's only oh, yeah. three players there that, that have scale. You know, we're, we're an AWS shop. Um, you know, they're, they're being a very aggressive. Um, so to move data within that cloud environment and make sure it's got interoperability out into the ad tech ecosystem is, is critical. Frankly, do you need a clean room to, to do that? now uh, we might hop that <laughs> i think that's another debate um so that it was more of an internal challenge just to kind of unify our data because you know when i first came in and it's an interesting you might have the same thing on the cvs side but yeah a richard nunn could be a business traveler with a united.com or a gmail.com i could be a parent with my kids so I might have six or seven IDs against me. It's not unique, right? So we had to do a lot of work on our side to make sure we did have a unique ID, and we've now got that to 108 million uniques, um, all verified. The great thing that I didn't know about being in an airline um, was those five key data points when you book your flight. There's name, address, email, zip code, mobile. They're the five golden records that you need. So we did a bunch of identity match testing. We were at 96% match. The 4% was kids. <laughs> so we're pretty much 100% verified. So that, that was, a, I, and I didn't know that going in. Um, so that, that was a nice surprise, but we still had to get there behind the scenes. So that was our biggest challenge. But I think going forward from an external inter interoperability, it's still complicated, right? There's a lot of pipes out there you know, live ramp are pretty much at the epicenter of it. Um, you know, is that a sustainable model? Question, I don't know. Um, but I think the cloud the cloud will win whichever way we're going to end up. Um, so, yeah, that was our perspective. So data collaboration is a key topic for you yeah. uh, and maybe a challenge for everyone. No silver bullet that I understand, so... Uh, lots of offering on the market. Maybe it's too technical. It's easy to to world colliding from technical and media. How are we? Are we? Um, is it? Do you think it's a marketing issue, or it's more that the offering onto the market is not really responding to the needs that we have? Um, um, because I mean, data collaboration. It's we've seen a lot of. I mean, I'm coming. I was at Amazon before, so we were. We launched some clean rooms and some services to on the market, but it takes time to, to scale, it takes time to get adoption. Um, well, it, takes it, two, it takes two to tango, right? You need two people on both sides to make it work. And if one's with a Habu, one's with a Snowflake, one's with an AWS, and you've got to, you know, it's it's just, that's painful. Which is why I do think we're, we're, we're going to end up in the cloud, um, which would just be a, a lot easier on that front. We do, we do, this industry, we love to make it complex. <laughs> we really do. <laughs> well, that way you get a lot of uh, well-funded technology companies, and That's true. they get to be a part of it. We earlier we were talking about this also, and I think retail media and commerce media, whatever you want to call it, I think is becoming more of who the publishers are.
from the old world. And as a publisher, a former publisher with many scars, I think the amount of players in the tech stack who are eating away at the CPMs, uh, a lot of us experienced that and it was pretty painful. We'd like to avoid that in the new world. I, I think, not to just jump on it, but I, the conceptually like jumping beyond the clean room, that's really interesting. Like, but it's hard because it takes two to tango and then what is that new space look like? We, we're, I mean, look, there are some RMNs that are very well established and been around for a long time, but we are all making this up on the fly. It's amazing how much is still under construction, right? It's complicated, but a lot of the complication is we're just, we're building it on the fly. So it's, I still don't think, you were saying this before, how many RMNs are there now? How many will there be? Um, there's there's going to be a lot of maturation that has to happen for the data collaboration to really function m much more fluid and, more, and certainly for activating media. So I look forward to that and I, I think we look forward to helping, you know, be at the tip of the spear and how can we drive more transparency, how can we build more self-service so that our suppliers and agency buyers have a more unified experience across the different media that they want to reach. Um, it's it's definitely going to take some time, but it's it's a very exciting place to be. Yeah, and it's, it's, I was telling these guys before, um, so if we're going to go off top, but it's, it is related, but it's a sunny day, it's beautiful. I just had a very depressing meeting, my first meeting of the day about Google and cookies and now they're going away, when they're going away, and that, you know the inevitability, and it was very publisher-centric uh, conversation. And we were just noodling on this that I'm going to speak out of two sides of my mouth. On one side, is it going to be 200 RMNs in two years' time? The other side is actually there's, what, 14 or 20,000 publishers? They're not going to be around. And they don't have the scale. So actually, is it easier to deal with 200 RMNs than 20,000 publishers without scale? So I think that's an interesting conundrum. And I don't think anyone knows what that answer is until the cookie actually does go away. And frankly, from my side now, and I've been on your side too, on the published side, I want it to go away like tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Like tomorrow. It will force everyone to sort their shit out. Because <laughs> it, 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 it's not there. And it, it must be super scary being on the publisher side now. But I think this rise of commerce media and it's you know we've now got financial services we've got ride shares we've got retail you know that is the new publisher i think to your point because they're verified they're at scale and you can transact you know with all the things that an epsilon or any agency wishes to but that's a big question for the industry it's going to be pretty seismic and i don't think we've you know, I'm kind of glad I'm on this side of the fence now, but it, it's it's a it's a it's a big interesting one, um, and it's all down to Google. But if you think about, yeah, you know, the reason why you've got those big wall gardens, guess what? They've got verified logged in data, you know, and 70% of all digital media spend goes to that. So you're only playing with 30%, and if you've got 200 commerce players, does that even up a little bit versus splitting the? 30% across 20,000 publishers. So it's a, I don't know, it's an interesting conundrum. Um. Yeah, maybe just going back to the original question Sorry. about the challenges. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think it's all connected to what you said. Um, what we see uh, from an RMN perspective um, is that the brands are definitely ready, more than ready. They have been ready for a few years now. Um, the retailers are not ready uh, for two reasons. If it's on site, they um, they think that they can do this already with the existing team that they have, and sometimes they think that they have also the technology in house to take care of it, and that's just not the case. So this would create a lot of missed um, uh, expectations. Um, so we are working actively on educating the market around this. The second part is more for offsite, is around the privacy. <coughs> and we discussed this earlier. Uh, the problem that we see there is um, retailers are very interested in uh, uh, sharing the data uh, so that they can get the brands to invest, but they are also extremely protective of the data. 
to a point where things get stuck for years and years and years just in privacy conversations, which in fact um, need, needs a little bit of attention. I think we need to find a way as, uh, as an industry to, to explain, okay, these are the regulations that we have in this market, which are pretty strict. Um, these are the necessary steps and there shouldn't be too many discussions around that. Uh, once we are extremely clear on the usage, it shouldn't be down to the interpretation of one or two lawyers, as we discussed earlier. Um, and that's the problem is that this is currently the case. Um, we are in endless conversations around, okay, where, does sharing the data make sense? Is it going to affect or impact my, uh, 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 my overall value as a company? Uh, it's it's, uh, it's absolutely, absolutely not the case. Um, it's just that we need to make sure that we follow the process that we have in place. We follow the regulations of the market and then we move forward. Um, so I think this is the biggest challenge that we see. It's more about educating the market and especially educating the retailers around this. Yeah, I mean, I can see that we have a lot of challenges is coming ahead, especially with the cookie deprecation, which is going to be very interesting as soon as it happens. And uh, the change of the landscape in uh, the way we are going to programmatically, because that's also something is that we want to be programmatic in the way we interact. Or we buy advertising in the future. We've seen that with multiple screens, CTV, uh, retail media, display video, and everything. So across channels and also outdoors, uh, across those channels, how we will going to buy in the future and what's going to be the, uh, uh, let's say, the organization towards that. I can see also lots of interest on the creating retail media networks, valuing and the valuation of, uh, of those first party data and logged IDs because that's really, um, I mean, you know that you are talking to people and to someone, not just a, a cookie. And I see also lots of changes on the advertising side, on the agency side, becoming more and more technical, creating their own graph, creating their own IDs, and being more into that in-between world, cloud, uh, the cloud and the, let's say, the, the, the publisher side and mixing all that together with their knowledge and everything they've done so far. So there's, I think the future is, is going to be very interesting. In the coming years are going to be quite challenging, I guess. So uh, we are approaching the, uh, the end of the panel. Um, uh, so I don't know if we want to say something more about what will be the future like and what we foresee in terms of your perspective uh, in your own business. Uh, growth, uh, what challenges, I mean, towards, we talked about cookie, we talked about the cloud, uh, but, uh, I mean, what's the future like? I mean, uh, what's going to be, uh, to be like, we will have robots, um, let's say, uh, <laughs> replacing us, or we'll have, I mean, wh how it's going to work? Any ideas? I'll, I'll kick off. Um, well, just expanding, I think, on what I said, there's a big open question around this whole commerce media channel that that's just exploded, and is that the new publisher? I think that's a kind of open question mark with, with cookies. Um, I do think as a subset of that, with this new emergence of, of kind of commerce, which is now big, right? It's up with 140 billion this year, or soon to be 2025. Um, it would be awesome for that cohort to sort out measurement. Um, that's a big thing that I think the whole industry needs to and move away from all the legacy stuff. Because if you were to create this whole sector tomorrow, what would you do? Rather than sort of hark back to the kind of legacy-based measurement solutions, is there a new unified one that we can all stand by? I think that would be a great thing. And I think we do have a window of opportunity as a cohort to kind of address that. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're playing with Gen AI and to your point, the kind of automation and some of the stuff we talked about. So straight off the bat, as we're scaling, um, we're trying to do it in a lot more automated way. Frankly, to, you know, cut out cost, because, uh, you know, we're building and probably you guys are a lot of, a lot of, you know, a lot of resources against it, but where you can automate. Because the great thing was when I joined, we had a white piece of paper but we also had a white piece of paper, <laughs> right? So, you know, but you can take the learnings of 15 to 20 years of ad tech growing and maneuvering in all sorts of different ways. So 
that that's exciting. So we don't have to unpack and un you know disintegrate lots of tech. Um, but I do think as a you know a whole new sort of cohort, we've got a great opportunity to kind of reset this new world, um, which I think we should do. So that that's my excitement. Um, but with still some big question marks out there, right? Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think the we need the forcing function of the cookie deprecation badly and soon. I think that will that will be a reckoning that that we the industry needs to just kind of resolve and move on from. And I think I'm very interested to see how that resolves. I do think a lot of it's going to boil down to increasing scale. Certainly from Steve Max's perspective, um, a lot of our our what we believe the scale opportunity is for us is obviously work more directly with more of our really big suppliers and brands and agencies, but also to open up more self-service, right? So either smaller buyers or the agencies that want their own hands on the keyboards, like let them do that and access our verified network in a way we're comfortable with. That's gonna be, I think, a really interesting component to the scaling forward. And I will definitely double down on your comment about aligning around measurement. We are we are very actively working with IEB and other RMNs to try to come up with a more consistent, replicable measurement system because it's we have we do have a rare opportunity to try to get this right in a way that's really going to work for our brands and for us. And it doesn't really work with hundreds of different solutions, each RMN having their own. I think I was at a lunch yesterday and I think one of the chief complaints that I was hearing from the agencies and the brands was just, okay, now there are 200 RMNs. How do I buy? And how can I even, there's no apples to apples for, you know, they're all different. Everybody has a different data set. How can I determine what is working well and why is it working well? It's omni-channel and it's a different RMN and there are hundreds of them. Um, so we, we have an opportunity to keep this really complicated and I, I am hoping and we are certainly actively working to try to keep it from getting as complicated. So that's more hopes and dreams than predictions. Mm, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's pretty good. Um, I don't know if I'm excited about measurement. I wouldn't say I'm excited about it. Uh, although I agree that this is needed. Um, to me, the things that I'm looking forward to is um, um, well, you you said it in a way. Um, 200 RMNs or 2,000 RMNs. That's that's pretty much what's happening right now. And um, and retail media has become too much of a buzzword. Same for AI. Um, I feel that this is starting to be a distraction from the from actual concrete conversations that we can have uh, around loyalty, for example, about reconciliation of the data, about actually making sense for the for the end user, because we we can, we tend to forget that at some point of time someone needs to. Uh, see the the ad and buy it, um, and so I'm looking forward to you know just um, uh, maybe the the industry um, uh, well sorting things out a, a little bit. Uh, but I think we're getting there. Uh, we're going to uh, keep educating the markets, keep showing what we we can do. Um, you're doing this, that's for sure. With equity, that's great. Uh, Publicis is definitely trying to explain it to the to the brands. Uh, they just launched an initiative called, um, um, well, I can't remember the name, but it's basically uh, making sure that you can uh, spot the bullshit when people talk about AI. I think that's that's good because it's it, it's always the same things that you hear about AI. That is great, blah blah blah. It's 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 just not adding the value it should. Uh, it should be adding uh, to the industry. So that's that's really what I would like to see. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we need to uh, to stop the bullshit. Then, we, what I understand, uh, deprecate cookies, and see how the future looks like. It's going to be very interesting. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you for this morning. It was very insightful. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, we have any Q and A or if we have any questions uh, in the audience. If we don't, then where? Oh, there is one. Oh, okay. 
Hey y'all, my name is Khadija Jenkins. I'm actually a research scientist and an academic on the doctoral level. So when y'all are talking about like data science, it's just like, oh, I love that. Um, but I also work with students that are from really underprivileged communities. And so I help them and teach them get into college and career pathways. And so I have tons of students that opportunities just simply do not come to them, but they are so mathematically strong and they're so career driven within these fields, but they just never get the opportunities to come here. And so I have a twofold question. My first question is, if you were to give advice to a 18 year old or even a graduate student that is in their master's program that wants to be in these spaces and help solve these solutions and problems, what advice would you give to them? And then on the other side of that question, as somebody that is a research scientist that has the knowledge and some of the solutions to these problems that it comes to simplifying the data, how would we partner with agencies or brands or companies to help mitigate that problem and create solutions? Well, that's a very, very good question. Uh, very difficult as well, <laughs> the advice to the 18 years old. Um, I think, well, first advice would, or maybe question would be why the person would wants to work in advertising or wants to work in marketing. First question, because maybe that's for the wrong reasons. Um, and second, I think it's, uh, the, but I do feel it's the right field if you're interested in um, data. Uh, and especially if you're interested in um, anything related to insights and AI apl applied to insights. Why? Because if you look at the evolution of AI in general, a uh, majority of the concrete applications of AI are going to be within the marketing industry because we're going to have the means to make it happen. And this is going to be extremely, extremely granular, the, the, what, what ne will need to be done. Uh, so. I would say that's great um, to, to really specialize um, on the AI side of it, uh, or maybe AI is a, is a bad word for here uh, for this, but at least making sure that uh, you, you get a good sense of what insights mean in the context of marketing. Um, that, that would be the, the advice. Uh, yeah. I think I would also say excellent choice in field because this is where everything is growing. And I think in terms of advice of how to get get into it is to just get into practical application. There are lots of internship programs. Um, my son did one uh, at a Sapient, which is owned by Publicis, which is their one of their, their consulting arms in media. There are a lot of great ways to get exposure to the industry to make sure it works for you. Like, why do you want to be in advertising? Some people really love it. I love it. I've been in it my whole career. But um, I, I think just to try to find the practical application and something that speaks to you. Because if, you, if you're into health and wellness, right, there are tons of brands and there are tons of media activations happening around that arena. Just go lean into that and figure out how you can um, do the practical application. Every single company in probably every single industry is gonna need data scientists because that, that is the future of, I, I think about it for myself, I think about it for my own children too. Fortunately, two out of three are software engineers already, so. They did not follow my path of studying French and poetry, so good on them. Um, but I, I think practical, get practical experience. There are ways to get it out there in our industry for sure. Yeah, and from my perspective, um, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about bringing on young talent. Um, just at United, we have, I mean, it's tough though. We had 45,000 applications for 300 internships. Wow. That's pretty tough, right? But um, when I first started, and, and I'm old, uh, in, in the ad industry, um, I applied for all the top agencies and got rejected. Um, but I had passion about it and I wanted to get in and, and I did and I went to a tier two agency and then I ended up at the tier one places and so passion I think is great. But also, have you heard, because you're all very young here, have you heard the term mad men, which is the 1960s ad world, and the new term math men? So this point around, you know, anyone who comes in with an analytical, data-driven background, you, you're going to do well. But just make sure to you're, you're in spot on. But make sure it's applied to this sector. But frankly, any sector now is it's all data orientated in some shape or form. So, you know, I'm I'm feeling really excited about this next generation, next gen, 
not next gen AI, uh, next gen coming through because if they're smart and focused on tech and data, they'll do very, very well. Um, and businesses are open, really open for that for sure. So, and just get push and drive, right? You don't get taught that at school. You've got that's got to come from within. So just if you want it, do it. Hi, um, my name is Martin. Work at Adelaide Metrics, um, big partner of Creative. Um, you mentioned the uh, legacy uh, measurement and being able to change things and, and think about you know moving forward. We have this opportunity. Just wondering what you think that opportunity looks like. You know, we have these leg legacy way of doing things, but what does that next level of measurement look like from your perspective? Well, it's a big question. I'll have a stab. Um, Incrementality is, you know, is is really obvious. But how do you define that? That's kind of, that's kind of really important. Um, so I don't have the answer, by the way. But that's the, that's a key question: incrementality. But also, I think um, the other thing in a world of programmatic and programmatic enablement is real time. And again, looking and talking about the legacy-based measurement, where you're looking like rearview mirror months ago. That's not going to help a brand or an agency kind of optimize things on the fly. Um, so where we can bring in incrementality and a real-time nature, looking at real dashboards that, guess what, all the ad ops teams are looking at in real life and how we then have brands and agencies looking at the same thing and optimizing those things on the fly that's consistent across the industry, I think would be a pretty utopian place to get to. Um, so that would be my view. I mean, uh, we're not there yet, but that would be my drive. And certainly a drive that I'm trying to get my own team to look at as we're building out our business. But Peter, do you have the same thing or not? I don't know that I could add a whole lot to that. I mean, that is absolutely where we're trying to get to. Um, I think, you know, for because of our mix of products sold inside CVS, we're, we're focused on did you sell that product? Did you sell more of that product? How much more of that product did you sell? Um, so f it's fairly simple in that way to just marry back the exposure. But again, it's multi-touch attribution. All these things are, you know, they're, they're terms. Everyone's got a different definition for what they are. So I think the real win is if we can get to some standardization and how we just think about what these terms are and how we think about what is incrementality? What is ROAS? What is incremental ROAS? All these things are, they just need more consistent application. And and we need the fluidity of the data so that, I mean, there is really, in my opinion, no true real-time optimization. The, just, the pipes are too slow. Um, so that that's something we talk about a lot. It's a great thing to have in the industry. I just, we're not there yet. So again, great things to look forward to. Um, um, I mean, uh, if, I, if you get me started on measurement, we probably need another hour. Uh, but in general, I would say yes, yes, um, incrementality is key. On our side, um, it, uh, it depends what you're looking at, because if you're looking at first party uh, or on site, um, then the measurement is typically easier um, and it would require just to look at the right tools. Um, you can use a third party in order to make sure that you measure the right things and you look at the right metrics. Uh, the difficulty comes with uh, reconciliation of data between on-site and off-site. How do you measure incrementality if you are not able to follow the, the same individual elsewhere? Uh, that's that's the tricky uh, bit. Um, so the only way is to have uh, strong identifiers, uh, and uh, this requires a lot of um, well, obviously privacy discussions again, uh, but it also requires a lot of uh, additional tools that you need to implement. Uh, that's what I uh, mentioned earlier with the core ID. That's that's the idea behind it. It's really to make sure that when we measure something off-site, we can tie it back to something that has happened uh, on-site. The next level will be to tie on-site, off-site, and then install. Um, it's possible because you can typically do this with um, CRM information. But if you start looking at uh, like install cameras and things like this, 
I don't think we are there yet. Uh, it's just the uh, your ability to do a proper match uh, is going to just be altered uh, very quickly. Um, so on side of side is possible. It takes a lot of effort. Uh, the next uh, phase, probably in a few years, uh, will be installed. Thank you so much. Uh, we are at time now. Um, thank you for coming this morning and for the insightful um, discussion. Um, we have lots of work to do in the future, so thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, if everyone wants to stick around, we do have lunch. If you have time, please join us.